Hello, we're Andy, the Maniacal Cinephile, and welcome to Boots to Reboots. Today, we're celebrating Father's Day by sharing our thoughts on the Stepfather remake. Andy, why did your dad never visit us at the hospital? Well, little buddy, he never wanted kids. After we got locked up, he got that back alley vasectomy and bled to death. Hey, but now, you can finally play catch! Go long, Dad! All of these shitty remakes Is there a single jam? They did it right already Kill the kettle to them Which any app we watching Which personality? One thing for sure could be The Stepfather is a psychological thriller that originally came out in 1987. Andy, what's a psychological thriller? Oh, when you're embarrassed that you're making a horror movie, you call it a psychological thriller. The original was written by Donald E. Westlake and directed by Joseph Rubin, known for Dreamscape and The Good Son. It stars Terry O'Quinn, known for ABC's Lost, who perfectly plays an identity-assuming serial killer who marries a widow, Susan, with a teenage daughter named Stephanie. The screenwriter based the character of Steph on his real-life teenage stepdaughter, who he wasn't getting along with. His own stepdaughter? Then I think we should really analyze that shower scene he wrote. <sighs> Interesting. Oh, yeah! Evil, stop it! I know Jill Sholin was 23, but she's playing 16. Having killed his previous family and changed his name to Jerry, his murderous tendencies continue after his stepdaughter becomes suspicious about his past. The film is loosely based on murderer John List. In 1971, List lost his job, but still pretended to go to work. He then shot his entire family, removed all photos of himself from the home, and left. Thanks to notes, letters, and excuses, the family wasn't discovered for one month. List changed his name, remarried, and was finally caught thanks to TV's America's Most Wanted 18 years later. Wow, I need to start leaving better notes at the crime scene. The original was well received by critics and spawned two sequels. So many stepfathers, and we can't even get one. You know what? My body ain't what it used to be. The Stepfather remake was released in 2009 and was directed by Nelson McCormick and written by J.S. Cardone, the same team that brought us the PG-13 remake of Prom Night that I recently reviewed. And yes, this remake also ditches the R rating for PG-13. So, no naked stepdaughter? No. Damn! So let's cross the stepfather off the list and see if it deserves... The Boot. The original and remake open in the same way. In a suburban house, Grady Edwards transforms himself in a bathroom. He cleverly dyes his hair a different shade of brown, shaves off his beard, trims those pubes, and removes his brown contact lenses. Brown, so when you look into his eyes, you know he's full of shit. In the opening scene alone, we can see how much the remake tones down the blood for its PG-13 rating. And thank goodness, 
We don't have to see the new stepdad's booty. A new man. He goes downstairs and heinously makes himself some peanut butter toast. Oh, and he murdered his wife and her three kids. Cue another white family moving into this newly haunted house. Now in Oregon, a recently divorced Susan Harding is grocery shopping with her kids when she bumps into Grady, now David Harris. I'm not married anymore. Still wear it, but uh, I lost my wife and daughter in an accident last year. Drunk driver. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Oh, no. His wife left him for the drunk driver. Now she's really getting rear-ended. Turned on by his loss, Susan invites him to dinner. The truth is, I'm just dying for some adult conversation. And soon, she'll just be dying. Six months later, Susan's oldest son, Michael, returns home from military school and is wary of his mom's new fiance. Good to finally meet you. I've heard so much about you. You being the Netflix show also starring Penn Badgley. It's also about a killer who changes his name, moves, falls in love, and removes any obstacle, including people, that gets in his way. In a weird way, this could be the prequel to that show. After a nauseating toast, Family is the most important thing. Without it, we have nothing. Spoken like a true cult leader. David invites Michael down to the basement, where he has installed locked doors and cabinets. Here, David tries to befriend Michael over tequila shots. Well, maybe he's not that bad. We're gonna put this family back together, you and me, father and son. Step father. Let's take this one step at a time. Like a stepladder. <laughs> The cracks begin to show when Susan tells Sean to turn down his racing video game. Sean didn't see the road sign that said quiet zone ahead. While having lunch, Michael's suspicions start when David calls his dead daughter the wrong name. My little Michelle was my whole world, my whole, my whole life. Lisa would have turned 11 next week. Who's Lisa? My daughter. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said her name was uh, Michelle. It's Lisa Michelle. You must have heard it wrong. Oh. Nice save. I think he totally fell for it. Damn it! What an idiot. Now he can't remember if he's in real estate or carpentry. Mrs. Cutter, the neighborhood cat lady, warned Susan that America's Most Wanted ran a profile on a serial killer that looks a lot like David. He checks the site, and the resemblance is uncanny! The old hag is now a target. Good morning, Mrs. Cutter. Quick, David, show her you're not a threat! Lay down and expose your belly! Dear God, I'm having flashbacks to the prom night review! Another lazy jump scare. What's next? Is a cat or something gonna jump out of the shadows? The director's prom night remake was all about the cliché jump scares while his stepfather remake is all about shots of Amber Heard without pants! Told you everything's gonna work out. Maybe you're right. I like you looking at me. Sounds circumstantial at best. Oh, shit. Might as well change the title to Amber Heard's Butt. There's the mirror jump scare. I gave this director too much credit. What am I doing with my life? David then throws Mrs. Cutter down the stairs like a slinky. If only 
she had a doggy. Thank you. She made us wear silly outfits. David then plugs her nose so she can't smell his peanut butter toast farts. <laughs> Susan's ex-husband, Jay, confronts David over grabbing Sean's neck. What do you even know Stop. about this guy? Huh? What do you know about him? Hey, buddy, she knows his hair dye stains the pillows. I don't know how you were raised, David, but my family never used physical force. It's not okay with me. Why get physical? When psychological scars last forever. <laughs> Doubts continue to grow when David quits his job working as a real estate agent for Susan's sister, Jackie, to avoid providing any type of ID. We need them, though, so we don't have to keep paying you under the table. I'll get all this done right away. Damn, there are no photos of David, yet plenty of Bigfoot. Especially since Mr. Foot got Instagram. This wasn't something I enjoyed doing, that's all. What? So does David not even have a fake driver's license? He's heard of Craigslist, right? Later, Jay confronts David for lying about his college history. So, everyone lies about their college history. I learned that at Harvard. It's just, it, it seems like you might have lied to Michael about college and swimming. Okay, he didn't graduate high school and he still uses arm floaties. David clubs Jay with a vase, locks up his luggage, and chokes him with a plastic bag. <laughs> Hey, Dad, it's me. Uh, where are you? Kid, don't be so clingy. It's suffocating. <laughs> he sends Michael a text from Jay's phone saying that David checked out. <laughs> Upset, Michael blares his music. In the original, Stephanie's father died a year ago, so this is where Jerry kills Stephanie's therapist, who is asking too many questions. Sounds like you had a strict upbringing. Are you interested in buying a house or in me? Because buying Jerry for the night will cost you 500. When the cat lady's body is discovered, Probably half-eaten by her kitties. Michael overhears the mailman tell David she had an accident and died. When David tells the family the neighbor fell down the stairs and broke her neck, Michael is alarmed. The mailman said nothing about the stairs or her neck. Busted. God, he's like the worst serial killer. I never blab about the 40 people I've killed. Whoops. Accidents happen. This must have been her time. Damn, and now it's been zero days since the neighborhood's last accident. Meanwhile, Michael's girlfriend, Kelly, tries to get him to focus on college applications, but he's more focused on David. You should obsess about something that really matters. Like me. Don't do it! She's hot, but crazy! Look at what happened to Mr. Depp! Hey, I'd let her shit in my bed. Things get worse when David visits Michael and starts making veiled threats. I don't want to see you have to go back to that school again. The regulation haircut reveals his egg-shaped head. Michael goes to check out the America's Most Wanted site, only for it to automatically pop up. The idiot didn't erase the history? Wait until Susan finds all the stepdad porn! Distracted by what he found, Michael gets into even more trouble when Kelly gets jealous of all the attention David is getting. What is it? You just don't want to go to college with me anymore? By the way, I'm screwing Mark Halford. 
Yet she denies screwing Elon Musk and James Franco. Michael manages to sneak a picture of David, but after his shower, the photo has been deleted. Damn, he was saving that for the spank bank. The situation comes to a head when David intercepts a text message and email from Jackie about hiring an investigator. Portland Tribune. Hello, I need to speak to someone about canceling a subscription. Uh-oh, when this guy cancels a newspaper, shit is about to go down. The climax should be him trying to cancel the cable. They show no mercy. As Jackie leaves for vacation, her motion-activated light turns on. However, it's just an umbrella. She needs that umbrella too. Cause she's about to get wet. Well, she did want to relax in a pool. Evil, what are you doing? Huh? Taking notes. Why? I notice he's a strangler. It's more subtle and less messy. Compared to what? My double-bladed chainsaw. In the original, this is when Jerry's former brother-in-law has tracked him down for revenge. Only to end up like Dick Halloran. Hey baby, you shining? Cause my dick's hollering. Why? Determined to discover what's in those locked cabinets, Michael breaks into the basement as Kelly keeps a lookout for a wealthy older partner. In the basement, Michael eventually discovers his dad's bags, cell phone, and body in a freezer. That monster! He's been hiding the ice cream sandwiches! Kelly, whose vision is based on movement, runs to warn Michael, but is knocked out. What are you doing, Kelly? Wait until the tabloids hear about this. David traps Michael down in the basement while he looks for his knives. I too can never find anything in those drawers. The commotion finally wakes up Susan and a confused David berates her parenting. I thought you could be Mrs. Grady Edwards, but you can't. What did you say? Who am I here? Who you are is a piss-poor serial killer who can't come up with a backstory, get a fake ID, delete his search history, or even properly dye his hair a different color! In the original, everything led up to this moment. Hell, it's the tagline on the poster. Hodgkins, what's to get wrong? What did you say? Wait a minute. Who am I here? Jerry. Jerry Blake. Thank you, honey. Wow, there was more blood on that phone than in the entire remake. Jerry, in the original, comes off as confused and crazy, while David just seems like an idiot. Who am I here? That oh shit moment is when I fell in love with the original, and sadly, in the remake, it doesn't pack the same punch. The performance, the editing, and distracting lightning in the background doesn't let the moment breathe. Well, David is known for choking. David chases Susan with a knife, and she locks herself in the bathroom. Oh, it wouldn't be the first time David stabbed her in the guts. Are you ready? <laughs> David kicks in the door, shattering the mirror behind it. Susan picks up one of the glass shards, sharts her pants, and stabs David in the neck. After all, shattering a mirror is bad luck.
David falls into the tub, apparently dead. How awful. That's where rubber duckies play. Michael escapes from the basement, picks up Kelly, and they find Susan in the hallway. However, unlike Jay, you can count on David to show up. <sighs> Must be nice to have a dad you can count on. David chases all of them into the attic, where he and Michael fight. Careful where you step. Still some rotted boards I haven't replaced yet. But David said he would fix those boards weeks ago. Quick, Susan! Nag him to death! Not listening, Michael falls through the floor. But do not worry. Kelly is on the way! Maybe she should call her friend Aquaman. Did no one listen to David about the rotting floor? Wait. They didn't listen to him. They have accepted him as dad. What really sucks is that the swinging saw moment from the trailer isn't even in the final movie. So save yourself the time, and just watch the trailer. Like Goldberg spearing Lesnar through the barricade, the two end up on the roof. I killed Mufasa. Both fall off the edge of the roof to the ground, where they lie, unconscious. Ugh, I hate it when a fight ends in a double countout. Boo! When Michael wakes up, he finds out he's been in a coma for over a month. Is that you, Kelly? I don't recognize you with pants. Michael learns that David fled the scene and is still alive. Uh-oh, get the nurse. He's going back into his coma. We see that David, now Chris, has again changed his appearance to look like Dane Cook. No matter what David does to his face, you can tell it's still him. If only he knew a good plastic surgeon. Terry O'Quinn in the original was a much better chameleon. I mean, that wasn't even his real hair. No. We're talking about the Merkin. The movie ends with David, or Chris, meeting a mom and her kids who are sure to be his next victims. I kind of know what you're going through. I lost my husband two years ago. He was last seen in aisle 12. In the original, Jerry dies until money brings him back for the sequel. It also ends with Stephanie cutting down Jerry's birdhouse, which became a symbol of their family bond. The original's ending feels less rushed and has the better resolution. Andy, what are you getting your dad for Father's Day? I just re-gift him the same tie every year. I have an idea. Let's cook on the grill with Dad. Oh, God! The original was a decent 80s thriller with a tense, well-structured plot and was carried by Terry O'Quinn's performance. Even the mother and daughter were likable. Remake Susan ignores David's flaws and everyone's warnings because she's just too in love. <laughs> Jerry in the original actually seems like he's looking for the perfect family and trying to get rid of obstacles until it explodes. The trouble finds him. David, on the other hand, goes out of his way to kill people. The remake is a mild thriller with a dull, tedious pace lacking any suspense. The ending feels rushed and cut to bits to keep the film under two hours. Even now, it could lose another ten minutes. Simply put, it's too bloated. Like Jackie at the bottom of that pool. Susan didn't need three kids. Sean's only moment is getting grabbed by the neck, and I actually forgot Susan had a daughter because she does nothing. They completely disappear at the end. Yeah, where are her kids? 
Not with their father! Gone are these satirical takes on family values, and Dylan Walsh lacks Terry O'Quinn's charm and charisma. It's better than the writer and director's Prom Night remake, but that's not saying much. This feels like a lame Lifetime movie. The remake of The Stepfather is more like the bastard stepchild. Therefore, it's getting the boot! Happy Father's Day! Shit! I mean, Happy Father's Day! This has been Andy, the Maniacal Cinephile. Thanks for liking and subscribing. We'll see you next time.